ladies and gentlemen, good morning, welcome. <coughs> Indeed, I'm going to speak about wave kinetic theory. First of all, I will uh, give a brief introduction to wave kinetic theory for um, those people um, who have not yet encountered it before. Then I will use some photon acceleration as an example. I will move on to show how that can be um, extended to, um, for modulational instabilities to filamentation instabilities, which are related. Then I will show that there is no reason why I should restrict myself to photons, because if you know how to do it for one type of waves, you can carry it over to another type of wave. I will show how this can be applied to look at solid information in the magnetosphere of Earth. It's not quite lasers, but still very nice that you can um, carry over one, um, a certain method from one uh, configuration to another. And then I will round up. Well, first of all, um, there is a certain connection between particles and waves. Um, especially in the early days of quantum mechanics, people discovered that particles in many ways can also be regarded as waves. Roughly works as follows, you start with a collection of individual particles. If you have very many particles, then you move your over to a distribution function. From the distribution function, um, in a quantum mechanics sense, you can evolve to the Wigner function, and then eventually you can make the final step to the wave function, describing your particles. And here you see how you can make the connection from particles to waves. And that led to some confusion initially. For example, J.J. Thompson, he studied cathode rays, and he concluded cathode rays, rays are not waves. They are um, a stream of particles. Let's call them electrons. Received the Nobel Prize for it. And then his son, G.P. Thompson, I'm oh, sorry, Dad, but those electrons of yours, they're waves after all. <laughs> and he got the Nobel Prize for that 30 years later. Of course, you can do that chain one direction, you can chain the opposite direction. You can start with a wave function or a wave. You can take the Wigner function corresponding to that wave. You can convert that to a distribution function. And then you can see that in certain ways, photons can be treated as individual particles. <laughs> For example, Albert Einstein, uh, photoelectric effect, photons that can be treated as particles in certain ways they behave as particles. Got the Nobel Prize for that also. Well, and I'm saying, okay, fair enough, photos are particles. Particles can be accelerated, and therefore photos can be accelerated. And I studied this for years, and it's indeed as simple as that. And there are other types of waves that can also be treated as particles and can also be accelerated. Oh dear. Um, my fonts were messed up. Um, what I was basically going to show here is um, I have a dispersion relation for um, electromagnetic waves in plasma. Omega squared equals omega p squared plus c squared k squared. Many of you will have seen that one. I multiply it through by h bar squared, which is only a constant. So you get h bar omega squared times is equals h bar omega p squared plus c squared h bar k squared. And below that I write the energy equation of a relativistic electron. E squared equals m naught c squared bracketed squared plus c squared p squared. And then I say, well, h bar omega is the energy of the wave, like E here. h bar k is the momentum of the wave, like P here. It's the same equation. And then we have the uh, Hamiltonian equation, the x dt equals the h dp, and we can identify that with the omega dk. And then we see that what for an electron would be um, the speed of the electron, for a photon, is the group speed. How nice. And also we can calculate dp dt, so we get dk dt, we divide the h bar out, we get minus the omega dx. 
So the Hamiltonian approach that we use for an electron can be used for a photon just as well. I have an example here, uh, a laser pulse driving a wake field in plasma. Um, the Wigner function is given by this definition. I promise you none of my equations will be much harder than this one. <coughs> we have a laser pulse. Um, the green one is the laser pulse that goes in, into the plasma, the original one. Um, it has a small bandwidth. Uh, all the photons have approximately the same momentum. It's spread out in position. It enters the plasma. The black curve here is the plasma wave that the laser pulse will be driving. And well, of course, driving the laser pulse takes energy. So photons at the front of the laser pulse, they lose energy driving that wave. Their energy goes down, their momentum goes down. At the rear of the wave, those photons, they are not really involved in pushing the plasma wave, so they don't lose much energy. On the other hand, at the very rear, the plasma density becomes large and the plasma wave starts pushing the photons. So the photons at the rear, they gain energy. Here is again um, the um, uh, second period of the plasma wave. Those photons here, they lost a lot of energy and then you get some more interesting stuff because photons in vacuum, they all go at the same speed at C. But photons in plasma, of course, they don't go at the same speed. And it depends on their energy and momentum what speed they will have. So those photons here, um, they've lost a lot of energy pushing against this peak of the plasma. And they have lost speed, so they slip back with respect to the wave. And if they then are here, they are being pushed by the plasma wave again and they will gain energy. If you were to look at the dynamics of electrons in a laser-driven wake field accelerator, this kind of motion of the electrons moving forward, slowing down, moving backwards, speeding up, for electrons and photons, it's the same. They behave in the same way. Now this image here, this is from simulations, we're using a dedicated wave kinetic code. This here is a um, spectrum from experiments. Actually, these spectra were taken from the transmitted laser spectrum <coughs> from the laser at the original Rutherford Imperial Dreambeam experiment in 2004. And what we see here, we see a laser pulse. The dotted line, not quite clear, but that's the mid uh, frequency of the original laser pulse. And the laser pulse in bulk has shifted a little bit to the red. And that makes good sense because that laser pulse um, uh, has to drive a plasma wave. It has to spend energy doing that. So the whole thing shifts a little bit to the red, reflecting that energy loss. However, there are a few lucky photons here that were at the tail of the laser pulse being pushed by the plasma wave and they lead to this shoulder here. Those represents those photons. So that was a very nice experimental confirmation of the theory um, that we had for photon acceleration. And actually, as a matter of fact, there was a 2002 paper by Victor Melka um, where he plotted the spectrum of um, the transmitted laser spectrum for one of his experiments and he nicely plotted a uh, Gaussian uh, envelope through that. You show, see, my pulse transmitted spectrum is almost Gaussian. If you ignore the Gaussian, if you look very carefully at the exact experimental observations, you can see similar features, but nobody recognized them at the time. Oh yes, it's it's very similar. Um, oh, whoops. If you would take carry this on a little bit more, well, for starters, you see part of the photons being accelerated by the plasma wave. The plasma wave would, of course, be damped by that. It's not shown. If you would carry this on for longer, you can push it further. It will look close like um, the current drive in Tokamaks. Because the current drive, you have particles and they sit here. And they have a wave that pulls them out. And you change the frequency of the wave, and it pulls them out. And you change the frequency of the wave, and it pulls them out. It's Landau damping gone wrong. Um, 
is this Landau damping not quite gone wrong yet? <laughs> um, because uh, the experiment had the gas jet that was only so wide. Uh, this was not the um, uh, uh, primary goal of the experiment. This was bonus. Because of the behavior versus the plasma density. Um, if you look at this behavior, you see how it increases with plasma density and other things. And for self-made phase modulation, you cannot um, uh, account for that. Also, the work I've seen on self-phase modulation is uh, far more symmetric if you, uh, if you look at this spectrum. It's, it's just the asymmetry that you see here. This shoulder on the red that's not coming out so well on the blue. That shows that. Talk about that later. I would love to discuss this thing. Okay. Um, technology moved on. Um, the diagnostics for photon acceleration became better and better. Um, this here is from a PIC simulation. We, um, we just have a PIC simulation. We simulate the evolution of the laser pulse in a normal way. Um, Big simulations don't know about photon acceleration, they just do what they do. Um, but we take the Wigner function from the electric field, and we see the same thing. Um, slow, the slow down of the photons at the front, speed up of the photons at the rear. This is even better. This is from an experiment using a frog, frequency resolved optical gating. If you look carefully, especially at this one here, um, I have to uh, remember this pulse moved from left to right, this pulse moved from right to left, so it's mirrored. But here you see the same features, you see this feature here, you see that feature here. Um, <coughs> also here you see stuff like that here. You see the same phenomena in the Wigner function taken directly from an experiment as you see in the Wigner function taken directly from the simulation as you see in the images from the photokinetic code, as you get from the basic analytic theory and the standard thing that photons need to decelerate, photons need to accelerate because of their interaction with the wave. So, it all lines up very nicely. These things have also been seen in, even in the ionosphere. These were photons, but they were radar photons, but, well, it only differs in the wavelength. Um, the frequency ratios are comparable to what you see in a later experiment. And if you look at one of those, um, again, you see this shoulder here being pulled out by the photon acceleration of the radar beam driving a plasma wave in the ionosphere. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was reflected from the ionosphere, but it also interacts with the ionosphere. It's, it's not just hard reflection from a stationary mirror. Yeah. Well, if it had been all stationary, then we would have seen nothing. <laughs> yeah, well... It's, it's, it's a much broader term because, um, in a way, you can treat Doppler shift as one aspect of photon acceleration. Um, for example, if you, have a, if you have a truck and you have a pebble that you throw at the truck, if the truck just sits there, the pebble will come back at the same speed. If the truck comes towards you, it will come back at higher speed. It moves away from you, it comes... Okay. Um, the previous results I showed were with um, long laser, the short laser pulses, where that laser pulse duration is one or two plasma periods. Um, for modulational instability, you need a laser pulse that covers many plasma periods. And the laser pulse drives plasma oscillation, but through photon acceleration, the plasma oscillation also modulates the laser pulse. Um, I will draw it quickly on the board. 
start with the long laser pulse. Rise a plasma wave. And then this plasma wave, protons here are pushed in a bit, pushed in a bit like that. Here they are pushed inwards like that. Here they are pushed inwards like that. And then what you get is a laser pulse that looks a bit more like that. It's not just um, the laser pulse driving the modulation in the plasma, but it's also the plasma wave pushing back and driving uh, modulation in the laser. And if you look at that closely, it's nothing else but action equals minus reaction. It's as simple as that. In a repeated pattern. So, if you look at that in your simulations, then you find you get bunching of photons in both real space and momentum space. Um, some parts of the pulse are red shifted, some parts are blue shifted. And you get a kind of spectral peak splitting that is not the same as Raman scattering. Because you get um, <coughs> extra modulation on top of the Stokes and anti-Stokes line. And we are going to look for that in both experiments and simulations. And instabilities like that, modulational instability or photon acceleration, they can be used, already are being used to um, diagnose wake fields. Find, that, find out what they are like. Um, here are results from my wave kinetic simulations. Here is the transmitted laser spectrum. Um, the black curve is what the laser pulse will look like if you have only vacuum, no plasma, no instability. It's just this. And uh, the red curve is 40 bars, which was quite a dense plasma, um, where you see quite strong modulation of the spectrum with these peaks coming out at regular intervals. Then look at the associated photon phase phase. You see a um, bunching of the photons. Here's the central wavelength, wave number, you see bunching of the, of the photons up and down from um, that wavelength. And those bunches lead to those peaks here. You also see the periodic modulation, roughly fixed intervals, of the laser photons in the underlying plasma. Um, my simulations could not explain everything. Um, there was also a certain level of blue shift of the entire spectrum um, in the experiments. Um, that was probably an ionization effect, um, but my simulations didn't contain ionization, so they could model that. Oh, uh, there were associated experimental results, but I think I added a little bit too hard. And, uh, they are not, no longer in the presentation. I will move on to the Filamentation instability. Filamentation instability is very similar to the modulational instability, but it works in the transverse direction. Modulational instability is uh, acceleration and deceleration of photons in the forward direction. Filamentation is bunching and deflection of photons in the transverse direction, just pushing them sideways. If you have a light beam or a particle beam that enters the plasma and there is an intensity modulation on that beam, then where the intensity is highest, uh, the plasma electrons will move out of the way and they will bunch where the intensity is a bit low. But then, on the other hand, the laser photons or the electrons in the electron beam will be pushed towards where the electron density is already a little bit lower and pushed away from where the electron density in the plasma is a little bit higher. So this effect reinforces itself. You start with the minor modulation. Uh, the next step, it becomes bigger. The next step, it becomes bigger again. Positive feedback, and you have an instability. Um, if your beam is intense, your plasma density is high and the interaction length is long enough, um, your beam will break up into separate filaments completely. It's actually quite bad because most of the time for many applications we want our laser beam to show a nice smooth united front. If it breaks up into individual filaments, 
um, how effectively we can use that laser pulse for any useful work, that goes down a lot. So, you need to know what filamentation is like and how we can, well, sometimes prevent, but most of the time we can't prevent it, we can only hope to um, keep it in check. If we set our experiment up in the right way, um, then at least the level of filamentation can hopefully be let, uh, kept down enough so that it will not um, uh, spoil our result too much. Now here is a case where um, I wanted to show how bad it was, so I, um, I deliberately aimed for parameters where it would not be in control. This is from one of my Raman amplification simulations. I start with a pulse, it grows, but here you can already see there's a modulation. Modulation gets worse. Modulation gets all the way to the bottom. The pulse is completely split. It's just individual spikes. Um, if I would show this, as in, oh, I did this with my Raman amplification, then uh, nobody would be very interested because this pulse looks just too bad. The thing is, by repeating this configuration and just lowering the density by a factor of four, I could manage to Raman and amplify a pulse that was completely smooth all the way through to the end. Um, not because there wouldn't be any filamentation, but just because the growth length of the filamentation became much larger compared to the Raman growth length. So, in this case, the filamentation is the fastest growing instability. It destroys my pulse before I can amplify it properly. With the lower density, um, the growth rates scale differently. So the Raman growth rate becomes the fastest, and I can Raman amplify my pulse quite nicely before the filamentation is, becomes too bad. And then I will have a good result. Okay, some basic theory on filamentation. There are three main types. Um, the first one is uh, relativistic filamentation. Um, if you have a relativistic laser pulse, it will change the local plasma frequency through relativistic effects, um, proportional to the intensity of the laser pulse. If you um, have a fluctuation on the intensity, then the change in plasma frequency will also see a fluctuation. And where the plasma frequency is uh, lowest, where the intensity is now, where the intensity is lowest, the plasma frequency is highest, as laser energy moves away. Where the intensity is highest, um, the, la the plasma frequency will be lowest, and the laser energy will move to those spots. So, the laser energy will move to those spots where the intensity is already high, and move away from the spots where the intensity is already low. And you get filamentation. Contra motive, that takes a bit more time. Um, Electrons are pushed away from where the intensity is high. So again, the plasma frequency becomes low where the intensity is high. And intensity becomes even higher where the intensity is already high. So it takes a bit more time for this one to show up, but it's the same uh, effect in the end, and you get filamentation. Thermal energy is for quite long pulses. Um, the laser energy, the, the laser pulse starts heating up electrons. And of course, where the laser intensity is uh, highest, the electrons will be heated most. If the electrons are heated properly, they will expand. So where the laser intensity is high, the electrons will get hottest and they will expand. Where the laser intensity is low, the electrons will not get as hot and the plasma will be compressed. And um, then again, you get a situation where plasma density is low, where the intensity is high the laser energy will collect where the plasma density is low, where the intensity is already high. Again, the same feedback mechanism, and you have filamentation. <coughs> filamentation is also uh, related to self-focusing. If I have a laser pulse, quite small spot size in a low density plasma, it goes in. The entire laser pulse is compressed to one peak, and we call that self-focusing. I have a higher density plasma and the laser pulse is much wider, um, the laser pulse will be broken up into separate peaks where each peak focuses individually. 
as we call that filamentation. But deep down, it's a very similar mechanism. Photons will be bunched, will be accelerated towards places where the plasma density is low or where the intensity is already high. It can also be described as a four-wave process, which is um, good for um, if you want to do analysis, uh, analytical analysis of this uh, phenomenon. We have two photons coming in. Um, at, some pre at their frequency, standard laser frequency and standard laser wave vector. Um, they are scattered towards each other, and there is a plasma mode, a, a plasma mode with a transverse K vector that makes up for the difference because you, you change the K vectors, and of course that's momentum conservation. Um, for, the, for the change in momentum, uh, that extra momentum needs to go somewhere. And that goes into your plasma mode. And that is basically the density fluctuation that you see in the plasma. And you can then find there is some, <coughs> you can compare ponderomotive and thermal filamentation, um, see what their growth rates are, see what their um, uh, relative growth rates are, their relative thresholds are. So you can then also see um, at in, in various uh, settings when um, your thermal filamentation will show up, when your um, ponderomotor filamentation will show up. <coughs> um, need, needless to say, uh, thermal filamentation will be especially dominant if your plasma is highly collisional and the mean free path length is very short. We can plot that out for um, uh, various configurations. But the bottom line is that um, in some configurations, thermal filamentation will be dominant, especially when you have long plasma cones with quite dense plasma. In others, the ponderomotive filamentation will be dominant if your um, plasma density is a bit lower and condition, collisions don't matter so much. We, um, we need to um, investigate them both. The good news is that um, the threshold intensity that you need to reach before the filamentation really kicks off will be higher for short wavelengths. And at X-ray wavelengths, you may never actually reach that intensity threshold. On the other hand, for um, uh, standard laser wavelengths, 800 nanometer, or um, even bigger for CO2 lasers, 10 microns, um, you will reach that threshold. There are some, uh, some work where you can look at um, uh, growth rates for various instabilities. Um, here's something you can try to do, and that's of course why people always use those nifty face plates. If you have a large bandwidth, your growth rates come down. Um, the forward scatter not so much. The modulational instability already a lot. Um, and the back scatter an enormous amount. If you um, <coughs> uh, uh, scramble the coherence of your laser pulse and increase its bandwidth, then the growth rates of your instabilities go down because they often depend on uh, resonances. And if you have a large bandwidth, then the resonance becomes less. And you will see less of the instability. This is something that using a wave kinetic method is uh, a good way to study. Because in the wave kinetic method, it's quite easy to model waves that are not fully coherent and have a larger bandwidth then would have a completely bandwidth limited sinusoidal estimate. Last summer, I was uh, supervising a student, and we were doing simulations of filamentation together. These were basically for uh, settings that had to do with laser driven wake field acceleration. Uh, laser pulses, pl parameters, plasma density parameters were 
taken from typical laser wakefield interaction situations. We use those, the PIC code OSIRIS to do that, for which we thank the OSIRIS consortium. Parameters we varied, pulse amplitude, plasma density, pulse duration, interaction length, and focusing distance. We take the Fourier transform to obtain the case spectrum and study that case spectrum, um, see how the growth of the filamentation peak changes, see how the position of the filamentation peak changes when you vary all those parameters. So we have the amplitude of the peak in the case spectrum that represents filamentation. Um, that grows, appears to grow roughly with the square root of the plasma density, so roughly with the plasma frequency. Um, that was not exactly a surprise, but nice that we got that confirmed. Um, the amplitude of the filaments was linear in the amplitude of the laser pulse, also um, something that the analytic theory predicted. Again, nice that we could confirm that. We also had the uh, increase in the K vector, the K value of the filamentation peak versus the plasma frequency. Also because the um, uh, wave number of a plasma wave was of course proportional to the plasma frequency. And again, we found an almost linear relationship. On the other hand, um, there were other parameters that didn't seem to have much of an uh, influence, um, especially not the pulse duration and the focusing distance that we used. Um, we saw hardly any effect of those. And um, the interaction length, what we found is that um, uh, filamentation uh, saturates relatively quickly after the interaction starts. So that once you have the filamentation at a given level, um, when it saturates, you will not get more in filamentation if you continue for longer. So for longer interaction lengths in the Wakefield si simulations, we did not see more filamentation. Okay, so much for the laser plasma interactions. Um, we can do wave kinetics with lots of wave. There's no reason whatsoever to only restrict ourselves to photons. I'm not choosy. Um, so the fast wave in the wave kinetics, it doesn't need to be photons. Slow waves, they don't need to be wake fields. Um, as various examples, I will show the top one later. Drift waves as the fast waves, driving the zonal flow in a plasma as the slow wave, in magnetized plasma. In the atmosphere of a rotating planet like Earth, you can have Rossby waves driving a zonal flow in the atmosphere because the Coriolis force of the rotating Earth can take the place of the Lorentz force from the static magnetic field. So these, case may, these two cases may look quite a little bit different physically, but mathematically they are almost identical. You just need to rename your variable. Another example is a, a Langmuir wave that can drive an ion acoustic wave. And a really nifty example is photons interacting with the gravitational wave. Um, there is theory, theoretical results that show that um, photons trapped in the gravitational wave can be accelerated and decelerated by that wave. And modulational instability, the longitudinal bunching, bunching of waves, is of particular interest here. Especially because it, for example, in the case of the photons in a gravitational wave, um, they come from so far, even if there is a filamentation, you will never see the entire transverse width. But longitudinal profile is easier because it just comes flying past you. So, the drift wave is a transverse electrostatic wave in a magnetized plasma. That's a strange beast, I know, but it's transverse because it interacts with the magnetic field. Um, the normal longitudinal motion of electrons in an electron plasma wave is turned around by the uh, magnetic field, and then it becomes a transverse wave. It has a wave vector perpendicular, perpendicular to the magnetic field. 
it has an electric field uh, parallel to the wave vector and also perpendicular to the magnetic field. And we have the plasma oscillations that are perpendicular to both the electric and the magnetic field, given by the drift velocity. So, we will um, study how drift waves interact with zonal flows um, through the wave kinetic method. Um, there was were some models developed where again um, drift rays were treated as a distribution of particles. Um, the dispersion relation was used as the Hamiltonian. Um, equations for speed and change in momentum for the drift rays were derived from that Hamiltonian. And the fluid model was used to give the back action of the drift waves onto the plasma wave or the zonal flow. And K here is the density of your drift waves. Kx, Ky are the wave vectors. We integrate that over that as we would integrate over any particle distribution. And d phi dt is the time derivative of the electrostatic potential of the zonal flow. So we use the particle model to model those drift waves. Um, of course, we had a conservation of the drift wave mode number. Um, Hamiltonian given by the dispersion relation and the equations of motion taken from that Hamiltonian. So, we used a 2D slab geometry to simulate our drift waves. Um, with a plasma density profile which was tokamak-like or a plasma edge-like. Um, in the magnetopause you will also see plasma edges a lot. And we had the following results. The drift modes immediately uh, develop the modulational instability, longitudinal bunching of the drift waves, as you would have seen for the lasers before. It, they drive a zonal flow, a slow, large-scale, almost stationary plasma wave. And then the bunches of the drift waves, they broke up into solitary structures, and they started moving away from the rest. Also, we could find that the growth of the zonal flow was controlled by the density gradient. If the density gradient was shallow, then the zonal flow would grow slowly. If it was moderate, then the zonal flow would grow not as much. And if it was a very steep density gradient, then you would see no growth at all. This is the zonal flow. The density gradient on this end was really shallow, and the zonal flow is really big. If you go here, the density gradient is really steep, and the zonal flow growth is really small. You also see it drives the zonal flow, and there are solitary bits of zonal flow being pulled away. Here are the drift waves. They bunch. Bunches correspond to the periods of the zonal flow here. Clumps of drift waves here correspond I'm so big, to those structures there. So, what we basically see here is first the drift waves bunch and set up a zonal flow. The zonal flow causes the drift waves to bunch further. And then we find that the drift waves on this end have such a high speed that, first of all, they are too fast to properly form a zonal flow here. The difference in speed is too large, there's no resonance. The drift waves in the intermediate part, they were slow enough to form zonal flow structures, but then they start pulling on them and they break them away from the main zonal flow. And then you have one period of the zonal flow with a bunch of drift waves trapped inside, and the whole thing moves together outward towards the steeper gradients. And then there was a lot of satellite data from the cluster satellite at the magnetopause, where they studied these things. And you see a plasma edge here <laughs> with a flip in the magnetic field. And in the electric field, they saw, in the slow electric field, they saw solitary structures here. And in the fast electric field, they saw bunches here. And if you zoom in on that, the yellow region here is blown up in these frames, you see several structures in the slow electric field, which represents the zonal flow. And clumps here in the fast electric field, which represents the drift waves. And that matches very nicely the simulations I showed in the previous slide. And also, um, these simulations here 
I had already published them in 2005. Um, by the time I was acquainted with these drift wave results. <coughs> so I um, reworked the code to model the uh, exact configuration for the magnetopause. Again, we see the formation here of a stationary zone zonal flow, individual periods being pulled away. And here we have the clumping of the drift waves, clumps of drift waves moving away. And we compared them numerically, and um, it, most of it was very close. Um, the only discrepancy here was that there was a factor of two difference in the wavelength of the zonal flow. Everything else was roughly the same. So, at this point I would like to wrap up. I have no idea how much time I took because the clock is not running. Um, we have a powerful new approach here in the wave kinetics. We can um, use that to study the acceleration of waves, especially of photons, um, but also of other types of waves. Um, if you look at the mathematics behind it, everything that's the solution to the wave equation can be used to match some care. It's therefore very versatile, and it can provide a powerful new way to look at things, because it doesn't matter how many ways you have to look at something. If you find a new way to look at something, you will always see something extra. It doesn't matter what that new way is. As long as it's an angle that nobody used before, you will almost always see something new. So we can use it for photon acceleration. It explains a lot of spectral modulations that we saw in short and long pulses. It's currently being used to develop a real-time wake field diagnostics. Experiments involved in the AWAKE project are studying that as we speak. Um, with close ties to the modulational instability. Uh, the filamentation instability is also related to the modulational instability of the transverse direction rather than the longitudinal one. We need to understand it very well so that we can try to control it. I don't think we will ever completely get rid of it. But if we can control it to the extent that it no longer troubles it, that's probably good enough. Well, relativistic and pond remote filamentation, we could study that already via PIC simulations. Um, thermal filamentation requires uh, collisions for the heating. Um, anybody who has ever run PIC simulations know that collisions are not their strongest point. So we are working on that. Also, the drift waves. Um, modulational instability of drift waves works the same way as modulational instability of photons. With one exception, we saw the breakup of the population of drift waves and the zonal flow into solitary structures. And that is mainly because the speed of drift waves in plasma is, can, be very, it can have a very wide range. There can be big differences between different drift wave populations. Whereas with the laser pulse in plasma, most of the photons go at speeds that are very closely together. So this breakup in, for a laser plasma interaction you won't see. And yeah, it can be seen in space observations. It can probably be extended to magnetized plasma devices. So if we have good synergy between wave kinetic and other models, full pick or fluid or EM FTCD will hopefully lead to a better understanding of how all these instabilities work deep down. And if we understand them better, we may be able to control them better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think it's very intriguing. And uh, I see uh, the way you, you know, present all these uh, instability, fermentation, modulation instability. It looks like some renaissance of, uh, you know, uh, nonlinear, you know, laser plasma interactions. That first uh, boosted up by uh, BK Pradihman Kao uh, back in 70 and early 80. And uh, now I think we're uh, having this renaissance because uh, laser intensity is becoming higher and higher and we're stepping into a new regime. And I think he's finding a new space for that. So uh, his talk is open. To your question.
Well, the standard way to counter filamentation would be to uh, put something in the system so that, you know, something against the filamentation by structure or by um, counter modulation. Um. I mean, typically, that's what uh, all, all people who work in wave propagation would like to do. For example, if you take a fiber, mm -hmm. you know, there's a variety of structures you can create uh, in the refractive index profiles. Right. And sometimes you drill holes through the fiber. These are known as holy fibers mm -hmm. and uh, photonic crystal fibers. So maybe if we can create structures in the plasma that by the way we create the plasma, by the way we launch the beam into the plasma. Um, you, uh, the, the properties of the plasma are not the same for the entire... Or you design the plasma structure in such a way that you, you, know, you, you add a negative growth rate to counter the oh, yes. filamentation. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's... Uh, some attempts have been made experimentally, I think, but theoretically you can create a profile that undoes the filamentation. Right. And then see, you can collimate the beams. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't quite know yet how that would work for plasma because all the situations I dealt with always showed a positive growth rate. Okay. But you could also see, for example, that in certain cases, um, the threshold for filamentation was quite high, meaning that if you are below the threshold, you will have a negative growth rate and you won't see it. Um, yes, uh, that would be one way to counter it. Um, threshold can be increased or growth can be decreased, as I showed, by having a bigger bandwidth. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's as simple as, uh, you know, changing the density of the plasma, what I showed, because I had a good growth rate for the Raman and a bad growth rate of the filamentation. Yeah. And in the first case that I showed, the filamentation growth rate was highest, and my result was spoiled, spoiled before I could use it. In the second case, they, they were reversed. The Raman growth rate was highest. Yeah. And I, the thing is, if I had continued my good simulation for long enough, the filamentation would have caught up eventually. But because the Raman growth rate was higher, I could already amplify nicely and say, okay, I have a nice amplification. Let me not ask too much. Let me not push too hard. I will pull out now. Quit when the going is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things like that. One more thing, this notion of photon acceleration is, I mean, the way it is postulated right now is rather recent, right? I mean, I recall Bob and Nandanka, uh, Tito. And so this is a recent way of looking at uh, yeah, well, kind of an upshift. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a nice way of looking at all kinds yeah. of upshifts in uh, photon energy. Yeah, uh, Bob, when uh, did this roughly start 20, 25 years ago? 20 years ago, yeah. I mean, we could call them by anything, scattering, upshift, Doppler shifts, everything, but everything can be now captured in photon acceleration. Yeah, well, um, if you, um, uh, well, thing is that if you look at, uh, there are many parallels because it's always a type of acceleration. If I have a moving mirror yes. with um, a Lorentz vector gamma and I have photons coming in, then that frequency upshift is proportional to gamma squared, yeah? But if suppose I, I, I change the, moment. yeah, okay. If I have a plasma wave yeah. with an associated Lorentz vector gamma, yeah. and I chuck an electron in at the bottom, it will be giving an energy boost proportional to gamma squared. Okay. See the parallel there? Yeah. <laughs> but suppose I'd say that, you know, let's take a simple, you began by talking about particles, mm -hmm. and then waves, and then particles again. So let's just take a two-particle event. The photon scatters off some, some object. Yes. Could be an electron, and then gains energy. Yes. Would you call that upshifting? I mean, would you call that photon acceleration? Well, yeah, I would, I would call it acceleration. Okay. Um, yeah, it's difficult because, um, uh, as I say, if I have a, uh, a small particle and a big moving object, and uh, the particle scatters off that object, uh, then the acceleration is so quick, nobody calls it acceleration, they call it scattering. Scattering. Okay. If, we have, if we have a pebble bouncing off a moving truck, um, then you'll call it. Well, nobody calls it acceleration, but quickly it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Raul, um, 
the um, I'm just wondering the the photon kinetic theory doesn't include the phase because it's just photons. It's conservation of photon number, which gives you the, uh, that's the right. Um, but I'm just wondering about modeling something like the Raman effect, where you really do need the, the phase. Because I know the modulation and stability, et cetera, it works yep. very well. But what about the Raman effect, where you really do need the phase? Because I remember with Albert years ago, we had a look at this, and we never actually got to the bottom of it. You would need a collision operator. Yeah. Because um, in Raman scattering, um, what basically happens, you have two populations of photons. One at omega zero and one at omega zero minus That's correct. P. That's correct. And with two wave factors, one pointing forward and one pointing backwards and being a bit shorter. So you have to have an operator to um, take a photon from one of those populations and um, drop it into the other population. Yeah. At the same time, there needs to be um, a recoil in action onto the plasma layer. And if I look at how people do such things in particle code, then you immediately see that um, such things exist in particle code, and they are called collision operators, where you have a plasma electron being stochastically pulled out from mm -hmm. one part of the distribution function. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is the yeah. coincides with some of your your questions as well, mm -hmm. because uh, we never managed to actually do that. Within this, but I, have you succeeded in putting the collisional, getting uh, collisional? I, I, I have not done that. Because your Raman simulations are normal, oh, using standard PIC code. But yeah, I'm just wondering, because it, it's interesting. Well, in the, yeah. in the PIC code, you don't need collisions for Raman, yeah. but you need collisions for electrons. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the thing is that um, when I started doing my Raman work, yeah. um, I, I had the PIC code that could do it. Sure. Out of the box. And I had this dream of once doing the uh, collisional operator, but I started with the PIC code because it was there. Yeah, yeah. And it worked so well. I got papers out, I moved to other things. And I sure, sure. No, we, 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 we did try and uh, introduce this sort of collisional uh, this operator to exchange the, you have to conserve the momentum and the, the, the photon yeah. number. Both. I, well, I had a very quick question, Raoul. So when you were comparing uh, filamentation growth rates versus uh, Raman growth rates, yeah. um, I, I, I wasn't sure if you included the, the fact that the Raman signal itself was growing at, in time as well. That would, would, wouldn't that then enhance the filamentation growth rate? Because you imagine you have some instability in order to... Um, oh, yeah, those, um, those were linear growth rates, and uh, they will not include the... Um, effect you show. Um, but the thing was, it was to show that if you have an increase in bandwidth, um, how these growth rates will respond to that. Uh, also, if you looked at, they were not actually to scale. Um, in a, for zero bandwidth, they were all scaled back down to one. But it's true, um, if you have a growing Raman signal, um, that Raman signal, if it becomes strong enough, especially if it becomes bigger than the pump signal you use, um, that itself will undergo filamentation also. Yeah, well, it depends because this backscattered Raman signal, in most cases, that goes out of your situation anyway. So if it filaments, you don't care. However, in the simulation I showed for my Raman work, there the Raman scattered signal is the one I want to use. And if that grows to large intensities and picks up the filament, yeah, that's just really bad news. Okay, um, going back to the modulational instability. Yeah. Um, and the end product, end of a modulational instability is usually where the whole thing collapses into spray of energetic particles. And so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the wave kinetic approach can't encompass that. So it seems to me as a general principle, wave kinetic is just a weak nonlinearity. When you get a strong nonlinearity, it goes beyond its degree of application. And that might be important, say, if you're doing uh, parametric instabilities in an ICS context. 
So it, am I right in thinking that it's basically a weak nonlinear uh, application and strong nonlinearity that you can't handle? And whether there's any kind of way in which you can say at which point um, the domain of validity is? Yes, because the um, uh, wave kinetic approach um, relies in certain ways on truncated power series. Mm -hmm. And if um, the nonlinearity becomes big, too big, yeah. uh, then that truncated power series is not a good enough description anymore. Right. Um, however, uh, yeah, for weak nonlinearities, you can use it. If the nonlinearities get too strong, uh, you will always run into certain limitations. Uh, power series that were truncated too soon, um, terms you thought were small that suddenly become big, and, and then you have to move on to something else. Right. So if you're thinking of something like um, NIF and parametric instabilities there, I mean, is, does that go beyond Stages, yes, of... but the late stages, no. Mm -hmm. The early stages, prob you can probably do, but the late stages, no. No, okay. Um, plasma with low temperature for wake field studies. We're trying to see how long you can actually propagate a beam through before the filamentation takes over. And this um, is also important. As, in fact, Raul quite rightly said he, he changed the density to accommodate the Raman amplification uh, dominant process over the filamentation process. So that's one of the reasons why we're studying this. And we think even thermal filamentation, when you've got a thermal a low temperature collision terms will be important. We're just looking at that. So that's an important um, side. Um, going back to Tony's uh, question, yes, it's correct. I mean, this is uh, the, the normal way of studying the modulational instability is to use the Zakharov type uh, equations that people have been using uh, for the last two, oh, maybe 40 years, actually, 30 years. And um, this is just a variation on it because Zakharov are dealing with a monochromatic structure, whereas this is trying to look at a broad band structure and see how that affects the, the growth of these instabilities. So that's, and also when you go to the uh, conclusion of these things, like Roman, Raman forward scatter, you get a very strong um, plasma wave um, growing and that will break eventually. And that's something that we, we can't follow. And that's why we, of course, pick comes in and so it's one there. Um, in photon acceleration, is it possible to uh, do this experiment with uh, nanosecond laser pulse in that so you can avoid the question of surface modulation? Well, there, um, there have been experiments where they used a rather long laser pulse, maybe not nanosecond, but quite stretched, um, to overlay an entire wake field, all its period, and then see um, uh, Bunching of that laser pulse in a periodic way, and that way to um, uh, devise the structure of the wake field that was driving the photon acceleration. And uh, people did that and diagnosed the wake field from that and compared that to wake field diagnosed in another way. For example, they would have their diagnostic tests against the wake field. Okay, uh, thank you very much.